Hey everybody, this is John with uh, Think Culture Daily, episode 7, I think. Uh, this is on the biosecurity state, that's what I'm going to be talking about. This is another follow-up to the Agamba Theory episode I did. Um, in, in yesterday's Think Culture Daily, I talked about the idea of the security state. So, these are both follow-ups. I'm trying to elaborate sort of some of the concepts that were brought up by Agamben. Um, talk through them a little bit more, explain them a little bit. So we did the security state yesterday, and today we'll do biosecurity state. And I wanted to bring up a few things that I forgot to mention in that video. Um, I wrote a comment saying these things on the video, but in case you didn't see it or aren't going to see it, I figured I would point them out here at the beginning of this too. And it's relevant also to the biosecurity state, obviously. Um, so one, there's a high degree of continuity in the personnel in the administrative bureaucracy from administration to administration. These people don't really get replaced, right? They're, they're holdovers. You can't replace all these people. You don't know all these people, <laughs> you know? You don't know why you would replace them anyway. And, uh, you know, what are your other options anyway, really? Um, uh, two, policy also obviously remains pretty consistent. People notice this with foreign policy no matter who the president is, no matter what they campaigned on, usually they're like, I'm going to get us out of these wars, et cetera, and so forth. They get into office, we get the same foreign policy. You know, people notice that because foreign policy is kind of a more salient element. But everything works like that, actually. It all works that way because they're all, in some sense, uh, they, they have some degree of autonomy, more or less, right? They just kind of operate on the basis of whatever they're doing, their projects extend through multiple administrations, et cetera, and so forth. Um, so the personnel remains constant, basically. The policy remains pretty constant. And um, three, the, they're of a particular class. They're all part of like the professional managerial class. They're technocrats. They're experts. They've really specialized in these fields or whatever. They're credentialed. They've you know gone through all the channels. They've become... Um, you know, a particular uh, of of a particular persuasion. They all they develop a kind of similar ideology. They're from similar backgrounds, and this matters because you know everyone the, everyone making all these decisions in our country are members of a particular kind of class. They have a particular worldview. Um, another thing is three uh, D printing. I forgot to mention. I think it's theoretically possible at the far end, right? At the far end of theoretical possibility that eventually you'll be able to, like, print a nuclear weapon in your living room, right? <laughs> I don't know what the uh, the technical limitation on your being able to do that would be. There's, like, kind of a choke point maybe in terms of materials, like getting your hands on radioactive materials or whatever. But um, aside from that, I don't really see it. And uh, even thinking about a nuclear weapon or something... I mean, uh, we're going to have a parallel development of technologies that break things down into print materials. Like you feed it plastic and it turns it into plastic filament. Like if we're thinking about low end, you know, uh, plastic uh, 3D printing, you know. Um, so we might eventually be printing in just like protons, neutrons and electrons, right? And then you could basically break anything, anything down into those um components and print with them or something like that you know again this is far in the possibility but there's an there's a whole spectrum of dangerous things that you can create leading up to that and it's just a it's going to be a constantly expanding inventory of destructive items that you can produce in your living room <laughs> you know so given that kind of context how you don't have something like a security state i don't uh I don't understand. Um, uh, then another thing is that uh, it seems like often presidents and those, their administrations don't even really sign off on these things. Sometimes I think they don't even know about them. Probably most of the time they don't know about them. Like with Operation Shamrock that I talked about in the previous video. I think they said that uh, they testified or something that like they didn't think the president had ever even been briefed on it. He probably had no idea that it was happening. And that makes sense because, as I said, these they're kind of autonomous agencies, right? The, eg, eg, exercising control over all these agencies and directing all their activities, keeping abreast of all the things they're doing just isn't possible, right? It, we have our society is way too complex. The government's way too 
broad and complex. It's engaged in every sphere of activity, in every industry, <laughs> you know, in every aspect of, of life. And it's just not possible. So they're just sort of autonomously uh, functioning, you know. And, uh, and then finally, thinking about uh, like the perverse dimension of the security state, like I'm willing to, uh, to uh, you know, submit that something like a security state seems to be necessary, given the amount of destruction that's just possible now, the amount of destruction that can be wrought even by a single individual. Um, but that said, thinking about the perverse dimension of the security state, like what happens when these unelected, unaccountable technocrats, bureaucrats decide that the gravest threat to national security is the election of some outsider guy with populist rhetoric who wants to uh, drain the swamp, you know? And I think that we've basically been witnessing that since he took office, a kind of endless soft coup, right? Uh, just endless investigations, the most expensive, um, massive investigation in American history, right? Impeachment proceedings, mountains of leaks and, and disinformation and all this kind of stuff designed to handicap his administration, which it did do. It, it has done to, um, to, I think, a pretty great degree, actually. So it's like in terms of managing the risks, right? The national security risk posed by this kind of figure, it's like they have a kind of portfolio of actions that they can perform, which if not taking him completely out of office, which presents a whole nother suite of risks or something probably, um, like civil war or whatever. Um, but you can still handicap him and make sure that he can't do a lot of the things that he would otherwise do. He can't get his agenda done, right? So in terms of, you know, that, I think that we have been seeing that. And what that means is basically the democratic process has been nullified. That these agencies, the power that they hold, um, uh, it sort of trumps the administration and, and whoever happens to be in the White House, you know. Because they're the people, you know, m managing the state, managing the population. Which brings me into a conversation about biosecurity. Um... I was thinking, uh, like, a good way to explain this kind of stuff might be actually to talk more about Foucault, and Agamben's interested in Foucault. So, um, so Foucault talks about sovereignty pertaining to uh, a territory. It's like a, a, a regime within a particular territory. It's laws that govern a particular territory, punishments that are inflicted for in bre breaking the laws in a particular territory. It's a, it's a specific, you know, delimited um, geography. Right, and then the the power is exercised um, within this vector. Then you have something like discipline, which he understands as being about um, targeting individual people, right? Targeting the soul instead of the body in terms of like the discipline and punish thing. Uh, it's it's about um, disciplining, subjectivating, normalizing power, all this kind of stuff. And then you get um, Security, which he talks about like later in his career, security, territory, population, that kind of thing. And security, he understands as being not uh, a regime within a territory, not a regime of uh, uh, for of individual self training or whatever, but uh, about a population, right? So the, the security state, I understand, kind of as being like, okay, now we're monitoring the population we're getting data on everything going on we're um, um, and we're attending to risks right we're managing the risks we're using all this data to calculate risks to make projections to understand the threats uh, that that are posed to national security and then responding to those accordingly and stuff like that so um, uh, you understand this, like in terms of biopolitics, right? That's the that's the politics of a population, right? That's when you're getting all the demogra demographic data, all this kind of stuff, um, birth rates, death rates, the rate of tooth decay, diets, uh, the, the the obesity, like all of the data <laughs> humanly possible or whatever, and then it it becomes part of the calculus of um, uh, like government governmentality, right? Uh, in terms of this art of governance. And he thinks of governance as 
Um, I think he calls it, um, what does he say? The, the, the conduct of conduct, right? So it's like a conductor conducting your conduct or whatever, right? So governmentality, um, the, the rationality applied to all these things, kind of the arts of governance, the, um, the, you know, it's a, it's a set of techniques, strategies, um, uh, you know, data collection, etc., technologies that are oriented to the population and the management of risks and stuff like that. That's the biopolitical security state. And then I'm moving to biosecurity. I think about this sort of in terms of like biopower, which biopower he thinks about Foucault. Um, and Agamemnon's really big into Foucault, so uh, <laughs> you know that's why I'm talking about this. But so biopower is more about um, like our organicity, right? The interior environment of uh, individual life, right? Of our um, our physical being. Biopower is about that. So I see biosecurity as being like, okay, now we're transitioning. Whereas in the security state apparatus, we saw the sort of paradigmatic case is the, the terrorist, right? The possibility of, of a terror event, etc. And so you get these surveillance technologies and, and, and TSA and all this kind of stuff oriented to like capturing the terrorist, right? The thing that makes the biosecurity state for a gunman so much more potentially dangerous, totalitarian, etc. is that it's moving from... From uh, uh, from this regime of, of the biopolitical and of security of thinking about populations and um, the administering of, of the life for populations, the, the the directing of the behaviors and the way they live in terms of the population, et cetera, and so forth. But it moves to thinking about the population in terms of their interior environment, in terms of being biological organisms, right? In terms of their bios, their 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 life, their act, the you know the biological dimension, and this is way more you know dangerous because now we're not um, you know like in terms of managing risks and stuff like that. We're talking about every single person now becomes. Uh, like a potential vector of disease. You don't have to find like um, people who have been radicalized, like signs of radicalization, right? You're not you're not surveilling all these communications and then trying to find like particular things that are said that like tip you off to uh, this person possibly being a threat, and then you you know increase surveillance and stuff like that. You're you're talking about um, uh, not like a few radicals that can be identified in terms of their behavior or anything. You're talking about um, every single person being potential unwitting um, spreaders of disaster, right? So the kind of the kind of even surveillance technology or whatever that would need to be applied to a paradigm like this is way more advanced, right? And he thinks that the coronavirus pandemic has been showing us what a lot of this looks like, right? So, and, and, I mean, the biosecurity apparatus, um, if it's about health, right, it's about, it could potentially be about, like, diets, like we were talking about with the heart attack case, right? If most of the, the if, if they decide that um, um, being unhealthy means weakened immune systems, which means much more vulnerable to, you know, the, you know, attacks with biological agents in terms of that, a, a big epidemiological risk, then we could be talking, and especially if we're also going the direction of like universal healthcare and stuff like that, where people's diets, exercise regime, etc., becomes a matter of public interest in terms of, like, we're paying for the surgeries and stuff like that that it um, prompts. We're paying for the procedures, the medicines, you know, the hospital care, etc., and so forth, right? If the... So it becomes a matter of public interest. But if you think about it, it being a national security interest, <laughs> you know, then the, uh, you yeah, know, the... The, the depth, the scale of the kind of 
um, social control, the measures of social control that would need to be employed, uh, deployed in order to to monitor, prevent, assess risks like this, et cetera, and so forth is, is um, you know, it's like astronomically greater, right? Um, we're talking about the interior <laughs> environment of human beings. We're talking about genes, you know, we're talking about... Um, uh, you know, people as vectors of disease. We're talking like with the coronavirus stuff. We see this. It's and he thinks of it as a kind of experimentation in the biosecurity paradigm, right? And we see efforts to, you know, move toward like perpetual mask wearing or like we're not going to shake hands anymore, or telework stuff like that. It shows the um, the way that the logic of um, of uh, reducing biological risks um, seeps into everything, every aspect of life and every individual person's life. The managing of biological risks in terms of the population, uh, it touches upon everything, you know? If it turns out that, like, <laughs> that, like people have been saying for a while, vitamin D, like vitamin D might make you much more resistant to coronavirus or whatever. You know, they could mandate potential hours of sun exposure, you know, <laughs> exercise, etc. and so forth. And uh, this doesn't even have to be in terms of law, um, uh, especially since we've seen a kind of willingness to engage on this kind of stuff, but it could be law. But, um, but yeah, he thinks that converting this whole security state apparatus, or, or I guess supplementing it with... Um, uh, this kind of orientation to biological risk management um, is just um, it's you know reaching its tendrils deeper into the into the actual life into the life process of of human beings you know um, like our interactions constitute specific risks in terms of like exposure to seven degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever you know like. You can, um, I assume, like quantify, and we might be talking about things like trying to move away from dense, densely populated urban environments. You know, we might be talking about things with public transportation. We might be talking about things like kids playing on playgrounds and different, uh, you know, scaling back from that and all this kind of stuff. You know, it could, the in, interventions in terms of, we're going to do telework now. There's not going to be public transportation. All this stuff can be justified on the basis of this is a major biological risk. It's a national security threat in terms of being a biological risk. And if you look at, like, the documents that these people um, have, uh, uh, like, for example, uh, we have this thing. What is it called? The National Biodefense Strategy, right? It's the first one that we came up with in 2008. All of them say stuff like... Um, it's vital. It's a vital interest to the United States to manage the risk, right, of biological incidents in today's interconnected world. Biological incidents have the potential to cost thousands of American lives, cause significant anxiety, and greatly impact travel and trade. Biological threats. They all say this: whether naturally occurring, accidental, or deliberate in origin, are among the most serious threats facing the United States and the international community. Right. So we have all this stuff going on. This is the first one of these. But we've seen kind of a, um, uh, I think starting uh, basically in the Bush era, we started getting actual like a movement toward stuff like biodefense strategies, biosecurity, etc. Um, official, um, what are they, like governmental strategies and things like that in order to deal with these risks, agencies popping up in order to help to prevent them, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, last year, we got the United States government global health security strategy. Um, it's kind of an updated version of the biodefense strategy. But all these things, all they talk about man-made, whether accidental or not, whether accidental or a terrorist attack or something like that, right? Um, or accidental. So if we're talking about accidental, or, or uh, natural, I mean, so if we're talking about threats to natural se national security that are posed by naturally occurring um, uh, biological threats, right? And I assume, like, we're, if we're talking about some of these, talk about that, like the global health security strategy, right? Um, 
uh, this is expansive. It's it's not just like epidemic or pandemic necessarily. It's not like bioterrorism necessarily. This is uh, the whole sort of range of uh, uh, of um, health risks potentially being posed to national security, right? So like you know birth rates and stuff like that informing immigration policy, et cetera, and so forth, right? All this kind of stuff in terms of like tooth disease in terms of we have we're eating this kind of stuff and it's causing uh, neurological damage you know the kind of stuff we saw with like trans fats or something like that um, there's uh, like an infinite array of things that can be called uh, and I know this my wife for example she's um, finishing up her PhD in public health there's an there's a an infinite portfolio of phenomena of um, incidents, et cetera, and so forth, that can be construed as a kind of public health risk, right? And then if we add to this, which I think is, is uh, the case or will be the case, we add to this the idea of mental health risks, right? Then, yeah, this is, this is a, a regime of control oriented toward um, security in terms of national defense, in terms of the, the, the vital interests of the United States, domestic, domestically or abroad, um, uh, you know, and, and we're expanding these potential risks to include, every, you know, <laughs> just bad health, maybe obesity, diet, exercise regimes, uh, where you go, what you do, how much public transportation you use, et cetera, and so forth, like, what you're exposed to, how much sun exposure you get, how, you know, how much you're outdoors versus indoors, et cetera, and so forth. Um, how many people you've met with or whatever, whether you were wearing a mask, et cetera, and so forth. And then you add to that even all this, the, the, the mental health dimension, if we decide that depression, for example, with skyrocketing uh, suicide rate and stuff like that, we decide that that's a a vital, you know, that taking care of that's a vital interest in this country, then you develop a kind of policy strategies uh, in order to deal with phenomena like that, right? And, and these two things together constitute the whole of human life, the whole of human experience. They encompass all of our relationships, all of our interactions. Every aspect of our life becomes a possible site of intervention for the biosecurity state. So that's why he thinks that moving from the security state to the biosecurity state really represents a massive leap forward in terms of um, just utterly pervasive totalitarian control over every facet of our lives, you know. Um, we might get things like, um, you know, we have genetic counseling and stuff like that. We might get things like genetic counseling that's sort of mandated and oriented toward improving the population or something. We might get genetic engineering technologies that are oriented to this kind of purpose. We might get, you know, uh, we might get, uh, like, genetic therapy that's commonplace or, or mandated or something like that. We might get, instead of full-body scanners at the airport, some kind of, like, biological screening. We may have the temperature forehead readers before we go into any building, you know, that's... The, the possibilities are endless, but the point, I think, for Agamben is that every person is the potential terrorist now, right? In, in a much more serious way uh, than before, because they're unwitting, you know? There are no... They don't have to be radicalized or anything like that. They're just... A per, you know, if you have a weak immune system, sort of, you're more of a threat, right? So in terms of managing these risks, you have to talk about uh, every individual in the population posing a potential, you know, catastrophic risk or whatever in some sense, you know. Um, travel might be much more tightly controlled or something like that. I mean, again, it's infinite, but um, these are interventions that, that proceed into the very, the, 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 our very biology, you know. There's like nowhere else to go. This is a the tendrils of this totalitarian regime, potentially, um, they, they hit the bottom. <laughs> you know, there's nowhere to go from there. And so he thinks this is a very serious risk. The coronavirus illustrates the degree to which they're experimenting with 
with these various forms of control to try to min to to manage and mitigate to prevent right a lot of this stuff talks about preventing too which again you're talking about i mean that's everything preventing public health issues <laughs> you know that's a <laughs> that's a mission that encompasses literally everything <laughs> um and he thinks that the coronavirus illustrates you know, our willingness to sacrifice these things and to move into this kind of regime. It shows, like, the, the, um, the thoroughness, you know, of, of these interventions and stuff, and that it really uh, bodes ill for uh, the, the future of humanity. <laughs> you know? And we ought to really pause and think about where we're going and what all this means. So that's what he thinks. That's the biosecurity stuff. I hope that was, uh, you know, interesting. Adding it a little, <laughs> adding uh, uh, this little bit of commentary on the on the security state part. Um, I think that they supplement each other, right? And um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I hope you uh, enjoyed. Remember, don't simply think or don't don't simply react, but think culture. <laughs>